Go to thekennedyreport.com and visit the TKR store to see our new products, Kennedy's Choice Beard Oil. You can use this on your beard to help with alleviating itchiness, dryness, and irritation of skin. And don't worry, no animals were used in testing this product except for myself. Use Kennedy's Choice Beard Balm for a softer, healthier, manageable beard that is made with natural ingredients. And trust me, I know a thing or two about beards. Visit thekennedyreport.com and check out the TKR store. The links for this are in the description. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Who was Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre? What is the Society of St. Pius X? Why should people even care about Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre? Was he a hero? Was he a renegade? Was he someone that we should be exalting in the traditional Catholic movement? Not just in the movement, but in the church as a whole. We're going to go over the Coles notes of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre's life today. And the reason we're doing that is because we live in a time of great crisis in the church where many people are considering the question of traditionalism, the Society of St. Pius X, and so forth. And as a result, of course, people are considering the controversy of his life. I don't know if you guys remember from a couple years ago. I guess it would have been 2020 at this point, so almost three years ago. The... Uh, the magnanimous and very well-known priest, Father Altman, he put out a video, or it was put out by, I think, Alpha News, recording this homily of, or the, I guess this, this you know, videotaped version of a homily of Father Altman that went completely viral. It got bazillions of views on the internet, and he talked in there about how you can't be a Democrat and be Catholic. Perhaps you remember this. It was, <laughs> it was pretty special, and it went pretty far. Uh, sparked a lot of outrage, but it was true. Anyway, he had a line in that video, and I can't remember the context, but he talked about, you know, basically why would a society descend, why would a society descend into a pro-death perspective? And he said, it's because the society doesn't know God. And if you don't know someone, you can't love someone. He used the analogy, he said, he doesn't know anybody in the country of Borneo. Uh, so he doesn't love anybody in Borneo in the sense of knowing them. And I think in the subsequent video, he said people from Borneo had actually reached out. And he said, I do know someone in Borneo. I now love someone in Borneo. The point being is that if we don't love someone, if we don't know someone, then we don't know how to think rightly of them. And this also includes our enemies. Um, you know, Christ calls us to pray for our enemies. Chesterton said, we're told to love our neighbor and pray for our enemies because often they're the same person. Um, whatever your opinion may be about Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, um, you need to know who he was if you're going to have any opinion about him. This is something that is very frustrating when talking to people about any topic, but especially the Society of St. Pius X and Marcel Lefebvre. People know nothing about him. You know, I remember watching a video by a man who I think is now a, a deacon in the Companions of the Cross, and he gave his take on the SSPX back in 2020. He spent 50 seconds, 30 seconds, maybe talking about the life of Lefebvre, as if that's enough. <laughs> That's not enough to talk about anybody's life. And he used that as the basis for his opinion on Marcel Lefebvre. And I thought that was just so wrong. Um, how could you show someone such little respect? In any case, we're going to go over the life of Marcel Lefebvre today and uh, consider the most important points of his life, why he is who he is, uh, was who he was. And, you know, that's going to tell us essentially why he acted the way that he acted. Um, and... I just released a book called SSPX, The Defense. You can see that there in the uh, description or in the uh, sharing of the screen here. And in this book, I'll bring that part up here. There you go. In this book, I endeavor to answer basically all possible objections you could ever have about the Society of St. Pius X. Um, of course, you know, the enemies of the Society of St. Pius X, I say in my book, you know, uh, they argue they argue almost like Calvinist enemies of the Roman Catholic Church. And what I mean by that is not to say that they're Protestant, although ironically many of them do embrace Protestant ideas as a way of condemning Lefebvre. It's impossible to answer every single possible objection that ever anyone could ever make about Marcel Lefebvre because it's endless. I mean, it's absolutely endless. Uh, just like Calvinists who are always coming up with, uh, you know, uh, accusations against the church, 
they recycle tired myths over and over again. And ultimately, people are just kind of kind of believe what they want to believe if they're very hard hearted. But I think there's a lot of people out there who are willing to give Marcel Lefebvre a shot and, um, you know, see who he was. And that's important because whatever you may think about him, the history of the church in the 20th century almost in a way hinges on this man. And, you know, he's either going to be correct or incorrect, uh, at least in what he did. You don't have to agree with every position he's ever had about everything. Uh, as much as I revere Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre as a great saint, we can look through the writings of any saint and say, well, I don't really agree with that part. It's it's rare, but we find these pieces. Um, at any rate, so who was Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre? Well, he was French. He was born in the north of France in a little place called Torquin. And just to give you some perspective, if you know anything about the First World War, if you know anything about where the theaters of battle were in the First World War, they were largely in that part of France and in parts of Belgium. He actually lived very close to a theater of war. We're going to get to his life through the First World War in a little bit, but just keep that in context. He was born at the early part of the um, 20th century. I believe it was 1905. And um, he lived through... Uh, the both both world wars, and he was a young man uh, living through the first world war in a very intimate way. He was from a family of eight children, and uh, five of the Lefebvre children ended up becoming religious. They ended up joining, you know, to be nuns or priests. Um, at least one of his sisters actually followed Lefebvre in his uh, mission with the Society of Saint Pius X, and she helped to form a congregation of sisters. His brother. Uh, was um, a very strong priest as well. And he actually joined the Holy Ghost Fathers, which eventually Marcel Lefebvre followed him and did. Spent a lot of time in Africa. Um, but one thing that I find very interesting about the life of Marcel Lefebvre is actually his name. You know, there's an expression in Roman or in Latin, and we say nomen est omen. What does that mean? Well, loosely speaking, it means your name is your destiny. Uh, I can tell you that my name, the name Kennedy actually means something like helmet-headed chieftain warrior. <laughs> well, I do have a hard head, so that sort of fits. Um, but as far as Marcel Lefebvre, the name Marcel actually refers to a hammer. And the name Lefebvre is an extremely common name in French. Um, and it, it basically means something like craftsman or smith. Um, so I think there's a little bit of providence in there. I think he was a man who very much crafted uh, a hammer against modernism. You know, we hear about certain uh, saints in the past being called, you know, the hammer of heretics. I think that we might say Archbishop Lefebvre was something like a craftsman of hammers against modernism with his priests. Um, his middle names were also Francois, Marie, Joseph, and of course, Mary, the Virgin Mary, Joseph, obviously the head of the Holy Family, and Francois actually means little Frenchman or free man. And I think there's a lot of providence in there. I think he was sort of a hammer of heretics who was free to serve the Blessed Mother and lead young men and lead the priesthood like St. Joseph, who was the foster father of the archetype of the priesthood, who is our Lord himself, Jesus Christ. I think there's a lot of wonderful wisdom in there. Um, his father and his mother were extremely holy. Um, in fact, they were Third Order Franciscans. And just to know a little bit about how, how heroic his father was, um, well, in his personal life, his father was actually an incredible business owner. And this was during a boom of textile manufacturing that took place before the First World War and slightly after in that part of France. And um, they worked a lot. They worked a lot. I mean, it was a, it was a very um, industrious lifestyle. Um, but the work-life relationship was very beautifully Catholic. His father had read and sort of imbibed the spirit of the social encyclicals of the popes of the 1800s and the early 1900s. And what he did is he sought to run his business the way that the church recommends that we engage in economic affairs. And so his father, he rejected a lot of the Marxist unionizing that was happening at that time in France and instead made a business atmosphere that was very much a familial atmosphere. You know, yes, there was a hierarchy because that's very important, but it wasn't like administration pitted against the workers. It wasn't like, you know, there was one class of people in another class. It was 
uh, harmonious endeavor where there was a sort of sense of mission and family and purpose in the business. And he was very respected for that. And his mother helped him a lot in this place as well. Um, they went to good Catholic schools as children, um, and they had nannies who uh, were sort of like second moms and who were very pious as well. As I mentioned, his parents were third order, third order Franciscans. And back at that time in France, there was actually a custom because Pope Pius X had recommended that people receive Holy Communion as often as possible. And of course, this was long before the destruction of parish churches um, at the second, after the Second Vatican Council. Um, so what these parishes did, which is so interesting, it just shows you how much the liturgy has changed. You see, before Pope Pius X, it wasn't really the norm. I don't think it really happened at all. I might be mistaken on that, but I know it wasn't the norm, where you would actually receive Holy Communion during Mass as a layperson. This is something a lot of Catholics don't really know. Why would we? I mean, I didn't know this. I mean, we don't live in this time. Uh, most people never received Holy Communion during Mass. In fact, it was very common for you to receive Holy Communion after Mass, which is, it just shows you the stark contrast between um, the old ways and the new ways with this idea of participating in the Mass. Now, this isn't to say that receiving Holy Communion during the Mass is bad. Of course, it's not bad. It's a wonderful thing. Um, and there are very practical reasons why Pope Pius X recommended this. And they make a lot of sense, especially for Catholic diaspora living in the modern world outside of Europe and so forth. There's lots of practical reasons, similar to why Pope Leo XIII had adjusted some fasting rules. Um, you know, the fasts used to be very strict, and that's good, but if you move to a country like America or Canada or wherever, where it's not really a Catholic country in the legal sense, you know, uh, if you're eating half as many or less calories during Lent and you're extremely exhausted and can't work your 15-hour shift at the factory, then they're going to find somebody who can. So... Leo XIII very mercifully allowed for, you know, meat broths and cooking with meat fats and things like that during Lent to give people more sustenance, which I think was very wise. Um, in any case, what his parents would do every single morning, unless they were super ill or something, they would actually go to their local parish on their way to work. And every quarter of an hour, so at you know, the top of the hour, quarter, half, third, three quarters, etc., for the morning, I don't know how long it was, maybe it was an hour or two. The priest would actually offer Holy Communion to the faithful. So what they would do is they would show up at uh, the, the respective time and they would say an act of spiritual preparation for Holy Communion. And then they would uh, receive Holy Communion and then they would say an act of thanksgiving and then they'd go about their day. And this was a way of people um, being able to and engage in meditation, engage in mental prayer, and receive Holy Communion so that they could be strengthened for their day out in the world. I think it's just such a wonderful thing. It'd be amazing if we could bring that back, to be honest. Um, and that was the norm. And his parents did that every day before they went to work. His father, Rene, was not just a heroic businessman. He wasn't just a heroic father who, I mean, just for a second here, ladies and gentlemen, think about the type of parents you would have to be in order to raise five children to go to the religious life. You know, one day when the dust has settled and um, people sort of um, see the truth about Archbishop Lefebvre, I really think along with a cause for his canonization that there's going to be a cause for the canonization of his parents. You know, we think about the um, the family of St. Therese of Lisieux, and it's the same thing. Her parents were are, are revered as saints. And the reason is, is because I think it was all of her daughters, all of their daughters um, became religious. And obviously they raised uh, one of the greatest saints that we've had in the last, you know, 500 years of the church. And, um, you know, what an amazing testament to the Catholicity of a family. His father um, obviously was involved in both war, when the first war, but then when the, the second world war came around, he was an older man. You know, remember Lefebvre was born, March Arcel. Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre was born near the beginning of the last of the last century. Yeah, we're in yeah this last century, and um, so I mean by that time he was already a grown man. By the time the nineteen late thirties and early forties rolled around, I mean he's an older man, uh, you know fifties sixties wherever his age was, and he actually volunteered and he fought the French for the French resistance against the occup occupation of the Nazis 
and he worked with British intelligence basically as a spy, basically as an intelligence gathering officer. And for his efforts, he was killed in a concentration camp. Um, we don't really know how he was killed. We know that he died in a concentration camp. Um, he was caught fighting against the Nazis, and then he was um, put in this camp, and he ended up dying. And in fact, the Lefebvre family never actually received the body. So they were never able to say goodbye to their father, and they were never able to um, give him a proper Christian burial. I'm sure masses, I'm sure many masses were said for him by his children, because some of them were priests. Um, but nonetheless, Archbishop Lefebvre, from a very young age, from his father, who was such an amazing example on him, he was given an example of complete sacrifice. You have to remember, Archbishop Lefebvre's father was older. He wasn't drafted into the, into fight in the military. He wasn't fighting age. Um, he had already lived through one war. He was already a, a, an accomplished person. He could have found a way to get the family out of France, you know, that sort of thing. But he didn't. Uh, what he did is he stayed and he fought. And not only did he fight, but he went into the belly of the beast and he faced certain death and did his responsibilities valiantly. And he lost his life defending his country. And this model is exactly the model that Archbishop Lefebvre imbibed. You know, Lefebvre lived through basically two occupations while he was older and in, in, in Africa uh, during the Second World War. But my point is, is he lived through an occupation of his beloved country. He lived through an occupation by evil forces, evil ideas, evil political concepts of the eldest daughter of the church, France. And he saw the, the witness in his father that it wasn't time to run and it wasn't time to hide. And even when he was an older man, it was time to fight. This will be very important when we consider just how Archbishop Lefebvre began the Society of St. Pius X, as he was essentially pulled out of retirement for what would be the fight of his life, and for which he would essentially suffer a white martyrdom from the occupying forces that had taken over his church that he loved even more so than his country. His mother was a saint, and I don't say this lightly, I mean, I, I believe his father was saintly, and I believe that, you know, there should be a cause for the canonization of both Lefebvre parents. But his mother uh, wasn't just a saint because of her virtue and because of her, of her motherhood and her influence on the children, but she was, it seems like she was actually a mystic. In fact, I, I put this in my book. Uh, by the way, if you're just joining us now, we're talking about the life of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. And you can see the book here that I have at Amazon. It's clicked. Uh, you can click the links in the description to see it. And um, it's a little overview here. You can see everything that's covered in here. If we look at the table of contents, um, there's a foreword by Father Charles Murr, a preface. We go through sort of the beginnings of the crisis in the church. Who was Lefebvre? Schism, communion, uh, canonical status, incarnation, legal existence of the SSPX, jurisdiction, the supreme law, the SSPX jurisdiction, uh, jurisdiction as it pertains to the SSPX, common error supply jurisdiction, state of necessity, the canonical commissions of the SSPX, uh, the history of consecrations, uh, you know, of, of appointment of bishops, examples of how there have been popes, popes in the past, like John Paul II, um, who actually disobeyed uh, the express will of the Vatican regarding consecrations, but he wasn't called a schismatic for it. Um, uh, the reasons behind the consecrating, <clears throat> what happened after, and even myths and lies um, about the SSPX and Marcel Lefebvre. Um, it's very complete. I, I personally, I don't think, I don't think you'll be able to find a book that is. There's a Kindle version as well. I don't think you can find a book more complete. Uh, I did my best to basically go over all possible objections and, and, and accusations against the SSPX that you could find. And I, I hope that I did the great Archbishop uh, a service and his good priests. I think, I hope I did so. In any case, his mother, I write about this in my book. His mother was almost surely a stigmatist. Uh, you can find this because of writings between that have been released over the years. 
between her and her spiritual director. And they speak about the wounds that she had received and are basically the wounds of stigma of stigmata. Whether it was a visible stigmata, there's a difference. There are, stig- there are stigmatists who experience the stigmata in an internal way, meaning they feel the wounds of stigmata and they're extremely real and they suffer greatly for it. And then there are those like Padre Pio and St. Francis of Assisi who actually uh, manifest, the wounds manifest on their hands and feet and so forth, and you actually see the blood on their body. I don't know if that's what happened to uh, Gabrielle Lefebvre was her name, Lefebvre, um, but uh, it, it is very clear that, uh, that she suffered the pains of stigmata. This is actually something that happened, I'll read this to you here in a second, um, to her, which uh, Marcel Lefebvre spurred on the religious life of the children, but just a little background. So during the First World War, the mother was essentially captured by the Germans uh, because the Germans had occupied where they lived in northern France. And Lefebvre spoke about in his book, um, The Long Little Story of My Long Life. It's a very wonderful little book to read. He was a recording of uh, a transcription of some spiritual conferences that he gave to nuns later in his life. Um, but uh, in any case, they lived a very difficult life of austerity. Um, you know, he talked about having to go to the local town, local meeting center, kind of like the community center every day for a long period during the war in order to have lunch. And they basically had watered down soup and stale bread. Um, and uh, that was the penance that he received as a young child. And I'm going to read you um, a quote here or a, a quote from a, a writing by um, um, Bishop Tissier de Malaray. And uh, he said, directed by her spiritual director, Father Ure was his name, a Montfortian priest, she practiced penance. This is about Gabrielle Lefebvre. Among her personal effects now preserved at the International Seminary of St. Pius X at Econ, Switzerland, are her hair shirt, so she wore a hair shirt, <laughs> and a spiked iron chain that she wore around her waist. So if you know anything about... Um, if you know anything about penances, look in the lives of the saints. Uh, many saints will talk about how when they ask their spiritual directors if they can take on certain penances, they'll, they'll actually say no, at least for a time, because it's too much. Um, Gabrielle Lefebvre, she was told by her spiritual father, Father Ure, that she could wear a hair shirt and that she could wear a spiked iron chain around her waist. So the mother of Archbishop Lefebvre was so devo- devoted to our Lord Jesus Christ that not only did she wear, you know, think about that feeling of having like itchy wool or if you had your hair cut and they didn't put the uh, the, the, the the napkin or the, the whatever around your neck good enough and you get hair down the back of your shirt and you have to go to work and it's like itchy all day. It's that, you know, and more. And she wore that. She just wore that in life. Can you imagine? Um, And she wore the spiked iron chain around her waist. So basically she had pain all the time. That was part of her. I don't know if she wore it every single day all the time, but that was what she did. And he continued Bishop um, Tissier. And he said, but soon after the privations and trials of the war years, Mrs. Lefebvre contracted Pott's disease or spinal tuberculosis, which basically means something like a decalcification of the spine. And this was from her imprisonment by the Germans in the basement of City Hall, where she had been confined for her patriotic resistance. For a year and a half, she had to stay lying down, encased in a corset of plaster of Paris, so like a a cast. Sleepless, tortured, and a living example of Jesus crucified. Marcel would later say, We understood what suffering is. We five older children were really marked by it. Our vocation to the religious life originated then. So Marshal Lefebvre himself says that his religious vocation sprang out of the suffering of his mother. Where else have we seen that? Well, think about our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus Christ was crucified. He suffered the outward effects of sin. 
not his own sin, but the sins of the world, the sins of the human race, and the pain that it caused him. But we always look to the Blessed Mother. And she suffered alongside her son in ways that we could never understand. And we look to the sufferings of the Blessed Mother, even though she did not deserve it. Um, just like Archbishop Lefebvre's mother, of course, I'm not going to say she was, a you know, we're not saying she was immaculately conceived or anything like that, but, uh, but she was an extremely holy woman. And her life, you know, she embraced suffering as penance. And then because she was so strong, God found it fitting to actually send her more, which was the wellspring of grace in the life of Archbishop Lefebvre and his other four other siblings who went to the religious life because they saw how his mother suffered. Isn't that amazing? Can you imagine a more saintly parental unit than that? It's very hard to imagine. So he lived through the war and eventually um, he decided to become a priest. Now it's funny, Archbishop Lefebvre actually says in his early years, he was a little bit of a liberal um, now, liberal is a very relative term here. Um, Archbishop Lefebvre saying he was a little bit of a liberal is nothing like saying he was a leftist. <laughs> um, excuse me. But he had imbibed many of the ideas of France, the separation of church and state and so forth, that later on he realized weren't Catholic ideas at all. And I really uh, recommend that everyone read a book called They Have Uncrowned Him. In fact, the Society of St. Pius X, uh, there's their podcast, um, they actually put, I wish I could make this bigger, but I can't really. Um, they actually put a um, a version of that online. There we go. They put a version of that online and you can listen to the audiobook. Um, and uh, it's an amazing book, and it goes over basically the errors of liberalism and how they really infected the church. It's a, it's when Archbishop Lefebvre one day is looked at as something like a doctor of the church, which I think he will be. It'll sort of be his magnum opus. That's his summa, if that makes sense. It's an invaluable resource putting together uh, just what happened at, uh, after Vatican II. In any case, um, he went to seminary. Now, originally, he had gone to the French seminary in Rome. Uh, he didn't want to go to Rome. He wanted to sort of just be... He wanted to stay home and go to seminary in France. Um, but it's interesting. You know, his brother uh, really prompted him to go to the French seminary in Rome. I think his father might have as well, but uh, maybe I'm getting those details wrong. Um, and Lefebvre actually says this is amazing because his diocese ended up becoming very liberal. And even before the council, there were already problems, of course. Didn't, the council didn't just come out of nowhere. And before the council, there were already problems with liberalism in French Catholicism, in the church in general. And he ended up going to the French seminary, which at the time uh, was overseen largely by a man named Henri Le Floch, or Le Floch. And he was an incredible professor, an incredible mind of the church. Uh, cardinal Billot, who was a French cardinal, who was uh, a beloved uh, he was under Pope Pius XI, he was under Benedict XV, and I believe he was under Pius X as well. Um, he was seen as one of the greatest Thomistic scholars of the last century. And um, he had the highest of praise for Henri Lefloche, who was the uh, seminary professor that Marcel Lefebvre was very much influenced by. So at the seminary, he learned the traditional Catholic faith. Now, you might think before the council, wasn't everything traditional Catholic? But you have to understand, you know, St. Pius X had to write his encyclical against modernism in the early part of the last century. Why would he have to write that if modernism wasn't around? It was already something that had been flowering I guess we shouldn't say it grows like a flower. It was growing like a weed, like poison ivy. But it had been sprouting up and it had been flowering within the church for at least a century. Very much, you can find the roots of this and obviously Protestantism, but especially back to the revolution in France. And I think there is something extremely fitting 
We'll talk about this in, in another episode when we discuss the issue of the juridical legal existence of the SSPX. Um, if you're just joining us right now, we're talking about the life of Marcel Lefebvre, the beginning of the life of Marcel Lefebvre. Um, as I just did release a book, which you can see there on the screen, and you can actually um, purchase a copy if you'd like. Um, I didn't write this book to become a millionaire. <laughs> um, like, there you go. Someone says in the comments, weeds, flowers. Well, very good. Um, I didn't write this book to become a millionaire. I wrote this book because I love Archbishop Lefebvre like a saint, and um, and I love the priests of the SSPX because uh, I'm so grateful to them. And um, it pains me so much to see them so maligned. Um, the attacks against the SSPX, I would say, are nothing other than demonic, um, pharisaical. Anyway, um, so I wrote this book. So if you do want to know more about what I'm talking about, I can only touch on the surface here. Um, it's about a 250-page book. No stone left unturned in the book. Um, as I said at the outset, you know, it's not possible in, in, the, in the ultimate sense to to answer every single objection, um, every single objection, uh, you know, that could ever be, uh, you know, released against the society. I mean, you know, the, the Calvinists are still proving that Rome is the whore of Babylon or whatever. <laughs> Sorry if that's uh, stereotypical of Calvinists. I know there's some smart ones. I'm just saying it's always happening. You can, it's like the, you know, Christ says you can't put new wine into old skins or whatever. Um, there's a lot of arguments that just get switched around and turned around and people send me emails and they say, can you respond to so-and-so and can you do this about so-and-so? And the thing is, you know, these people have these arguments that look like they're novel, but really they're just new iterations of old arguments spun around with a legalistic framework to try to confuse people who don't really know. I mean, why would you know? Think about this for a second, ladies and gentlemen. You know, I was thinking of an analogy last night as I was preparing to talk about this today. Um, and, you know, remember living through the COVID crisis? Maybe you heard of it. I think we can talk about this on YouTube now. Actually, I'm sure we can. You know, two years ago, if you were to say things like, you know, the medication didn't work or maybe mask mandates weren't effective. If you said things like that, I mean, you'd be kicked off of YouTube. And the, one of the reasons why so many people bought into the narrative is because, you know, they work, they have full-time jobs, they've got kids, they've got assignments to finish, they've got things to do. And, you know, they come home from work or class or school or whatever, and they're tired and they don't want to sit down and read a ton of medical journal, actually make decisions for themselves. They just, you know, they just sit down and, and they turn on the news. And the news gives them information that seems pretty authoritative. And the news websites, um, the news, oh, sorry, sorry to interrupt here. Apparently, the book is number one uh, new release in Christian church history. Oh, that's wonderful. Wonderful. Um, praise God. Thank you, Marcel Lefebvre, for your intercession. Um, in any case, um, I mean, how, why would you know the ins and outs of that stuff unless you spent endless amounts of hours? And that's difficult for people, right? Um, you know, so this is, it's very similar to the, uh, the SSPX. I mean, people obviously don't know, um, people obviously don't, most people don't know the ins and outs of the society. How, why would they? I mean, why would you be such an obsessive reader of all things SSPX the way that someone like me is? I just, you know, it's, it's, my, it's my hobby. So, you know, I've read, you know, I've spent thousands of hours over the last few years probably going over this stuff and thinking about it, writing about it, and reading about it. And, but why would you if, you if you weren't someone who did that? So my point here is, you know, in this book, what I've done is I've taken all of that knowledge and I've put it down into something where, you know, what is the spirit of the SSPX? What do all these things mean? Because people are going to continue forever. I mean, there are people out there that are so hard-hearted against the society and talk about it on the internet that I swear one day when all the dust settles and we realize everything is um, vindicated and so forth, you know, I'm positive there are going to be people who are going to be criticizing or saying it was wrong for Rome to do that because they just they just they just hate the SSPX. It's very to me it's a sign of diabolical disorientation. Anyway, all of that is to say is that in the book I answer as much as possible. Um, okay, so back to where I was. Archbishop Lefebvre was at seminary. He became a priest. He ended up joining the Holy Ghost Father. So he went to um uh Oh, that's a very beautiful thing someone said in the chat there. Her left cheek is a second-class relic. <laughs> she was confirmed by Archbishop Lefebvre. Well, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with us. 
Um, shout out Pure Bloods. Just saying. Um, in any case, so um, he goes to the Holy Ghost Seminary, and his training at the seminary was very uh, difficult. So he he went to the seminary in France, in Rome, for the French seminary, and then went to the actual congregation of Holy Ghost Fathers. And you can read about that in his biography by Archbishop or by Bishop uh, Tissier de Malray, talking about his training. It was very difficult. I mean, they didn't have hot water. It's very cold in northern France. And, you know, they had to go outside and walk around in the yard and pray the office. And all they had on was like a cassock and no gloves. And it's raining and they're frozen and their hands are getting frostbite and things like that. And the reason why they put them through that training, uh, most of them would become extremely ill within the first two or three months. That was the norm because they were preparing to put that for them to go to places like Africa mainly. Um, and, and they had to learn how to survive very hard diseases because as you'll see in the life of Lefebvre, if you read the biography by Tissier de Malare, he actually survived malaria at least once. Um, they had to have a very strong constitution in order to go and do their work. So that was what he did. He went through this seminary to be a Holy Ghost father. So, you know, what's interesting is the Holy Ghost fathers, they're called the Spiritans today. And, and in fact, today, they actually still do put out some pretty useful spiritual stuff. They haven't fallen as hard as some other orders. Um, the Holy Ghost Fathers were an order of priests where their entire spirituality was to be living by the Spirit of the Holy Ghost, living by the Holy Ghost. So it's interesting today. You know, we live in this age of the charismatic renewal and all this kind of stuff, and people don't realize, you know, before there was the charismatic renewal, before there was all this sort of Pentecostal influence, there was the Holy, the, the, in the church, there exist the Holy Ghost Fathers. Who would better understand how to live a life of providence than those who live by the Spirit of God himself as their animating spiritual principle? This is very important for the life of Archbishop Lefebvre. Somebody asked in the comments, um, hey, Kennedy, where is a good place to go to Mass, London, Ontario? Um, I go to the site of St. Pius X Chapel in New Hamburg. Um, that's about an hour. That's the best you're going to do. I believe there is a Latin Mass community in St. Thomas. I haven't been there in a long time, but they're very wonderful people, and it was beautiful. So if that's closer and that, and you're more comfortable with that, then then there you go. Um, but um, uh, London, Ontario is, is sort of a wasteland for, for good churches, sadly, and that's one of the reasons why the society is growing so much around here. Um, I myself live about an hour from London, but anyway, I did grow up there. Uh, someone says in the chat, you can't be anti-SSPX if you really understand Archbishop Lefebvre. And yeah, that's a good that's a good point. That's a really good point. So anyway, he goes from the Holy Ghost Fathers and he gets sent to Africa. So today, people love to talk about Africa as being... Um, um, oh, sorry. Someone said again, keep the new release. But if you look at the whole list, print version is number one and it seems the Kindle is number four. Oh, wow. Wow, that's pretty cool. Praise God. In any case, um, people talk about Africa as like, you know, the light in the darkness. And Africa is a very strong, conservative, Christian place in many parts of Africa. Um, why is that? Do you think it just came out of nowhere? Archbishop Lefebvre was a huge part of converting tens of millions of Africans. Eventually, in Africa, he was in West Africa, French-speaking Africa, he became, um, uh, the, the, he became the apostolic delegate, I think they're called. I, I, I might get my terms wrong. Basically, mission territory, before you have these normal dioceses set up, you have sort of a massive territory that's sort of like a mission diocese. And he became the leader of that whole situation and oversaw basically all of French-speaking Africa, which is huge. Think about all these traditionally Catholic countries in Africa. I mean, obviously they're French, they're Belgium or they're France influence, and they're clearly Catholic and, they're, and, and that's the religion that's being promoted. Um, Cardinal Seurat, Cardinal Seurat, his parents were basically worshiping totem poles literally, until the Holy Ghost Fathers came, and they were there, and Marcel Lefebvre was there during the life of Cardinal Seurat. I don't know if they ever met, but he, we think of him as one of the great cardinals in the church, and he's one of the most orthodox churchmen we have today. And his parents were converted by the Holy Ghost Father. Lefebvre was one of many, but he was exceptional. That's why he was, he was exalted to this position. Tens of millions of people 
were converted throughout his, you know, 35 years in Africa. And he had a huge, um, he had a huge influence on that. So if we talk about Africa being a stronghold of Catholicism, Lefebvre was the most important churchman in Africa for at least a decade when he was there uh, as a bishop. We can't deny that this stronghold of Catholicism in the world is largely because of the efforts and the holiness of Archbishop Lefebvre. You just have to, it, it has to, there's a cause and effect, my friends. So anyway, when he was in Africa, they actually called him a Bushman uh, because Lefebvre, he was, um, he was so, uh, he loved the, the African people so much. You know, you can read these stories about how he dealt with these young boys and he would set up these schools. I mean, there are stories of Lefebvre, you know, he's like in a cassock standing waist deep in the water, helping to build a bridge. Helping, you know, uh, for a little village so they can, you know, have better commerce and, and you know, helping to fix combustion engines and things like that. Helping farming techniques. I mean, you know, he just loved the people. He loved souls. This is why it's so painful when the enemies of the SSPX will say things like Lefebvre or the SSPX are Nazis or racist or something like that. And it's just, you have no idea. I mean, maybe they, maybe they do know what they're doing. The history of the man's life is just so much different than that. You know, just from a natural perspective, the way that people talk about Archbishop Lefebvre, it is so scandalous. Even if someone were to agree to disagree with his theological positions later in life, okay, fair enough, people disagree on things. But we're talking about here, we're talking here about an incredible human being, a charitable, compassionate, loving, fatherly figure. Who, I mean... How many of these internet warriors are willing to go and, and get malaria a bunch of times to spread the gospel? None of them. A bunch of frauds. And I'm an internet warrior. <laughs> so maybe I'm a fraud too, but I'm also not the one attacking this man. What I'm saying is, how many people who will criticize the archbishop are willing to give up everything and go to mission territory where people are literally worshiping totem poles and, and believe in strange demonic rites and just go and try to convert souls. The, no one, none of these critics are willing to do anything close to that. Most churchmen are not willing to do that who criticize them. Anyway, so um, Lefebvre did that. And they called him the Bushman because he became like one of them. He learned their dialects. He, he, he educated them. He helped to civilize their culture, to bring it out of paganism for the glory of Christ the King. He was the herald of Christ the King in Africa. Just a wonderful man. Eventually, he became the superior general of the Holy Ghost Fathers. And we find ourselves at the um, Second Vatican Council. At this time... He was a highly respected churchman, and um, he was one of the council fathers, uh, part of the preparatory commissions, getting things ready. And people under, have to understand, you know, some of the critics about Lefebvre as well, they'll basically say, well, if he was so against what was in the council documents, why didn't he resist them? Why didn't he resist them harder? Well, during the actual council, he did lead or help to lead the Cetus Internationalis Patrum, which basically meant the International Group of Fathers. They were like the, um, the conservative pushback. And um, uh, the thing about the Second Vatican Council is that, it, you know, Lefebvre writes in his, um, in his book, They've Uncrowned Him, I think he calls it the Robber Council, meaning like the council that was stolen. And maybe it's the Robber Baron Council, but it's something like that. And um, the reason is, is because these modernists, they had a plot. They, it's not a conspiracy theory. It was a real thing. You know, the council begins, and this is the time before the internet. This is the time when we're dealing with radio and television communication, pamphlets and things like that. Various influential churchmen who had, you know, resources. They basically co-opted their resources so that they could basically propagandize the bishops and the media with the ideas. And you have to understand, if you're a faithful son of the church, you expect 
your brother priests to not be evil demons. <laughs> just, you know, like you walk into a church and you think, Father so-and-so, he's probably a good guy. That's that's a Catholic thought to have. Sadly, nowadays, we have to be more, more prudent about that, more discerning. But, you know, Lefebvre was coming from this African continent where he was... Um, where he was um, uh, building the church. He was taking, it was like, you know, Lefebvre's experience in Africa, it's like the apostles going throughout Europe and North Africa and Middle East. Like no one's Catholic. Everyone's a pagan in false religions. And he's just concerned with, um, he's just concerned with spreading the love of Jesus Christ to the darkness. And he did that valiantly. The bishops who had been in Africa or in Europe and in America and places where they were almost getting tired of the old ways. You know, it was like old news to them. This was the diff- this was a complete difference. And this is why I think Archbishop Lefebvre was so providentially formed for this role. Because, you know, there were many conservative churchmen, traditionally minded churchmen, who did agree with Lefebvre. But they were so um jaded. I guess I could say, you know, they themselves had lived in Europe for so long. They had lived in North America for so long. Catholicism had already been the norm for so long that people just sort of naturally, when they get comfortable, they want novelty. That We all do want that in our lives, right? This is why, you know, the church gives us Lent every year and Advent penance seasons, because if we're not careful, we get comfortable in our comfort. We get comfortable in our excess, and we're supposed to have a time of penance, a time of um, less, a time of suffering. And this makes us hungry for the divine life because we get uncomfortable. Um, someone asks here in the in the comment, can you get the book on PDF? Yeah, your eyes are bad. I fully understand. Uh, if you click the link in the description, you can find a contact me link. Email me and I'll help you out, okay? Um, in any case, um, Lefebvre was not in that milieu. He was literally dodging malaria. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. There's one story about him in Africa when he. Um, there's one story about him in Africa. Yes, I will do an audio version. Yep, I will. It's just not yet. I need just a little bit of time. Um, there, there is a um, uh, a story about how when he was in Senegal, which is in Dakar, which was Dakar. Um, Sorry, Dakar, which is in Senegal. Sorry, the city. That's where he was situated. There was he, Lefebvre was huge on having religious sisters. You know, he, he it was almost like he wouldn't set up a new diocese or parish or something if there wasn't sisters located right there to pray for the people. This is a very traditionally Catholic understanding. He knew that the continent of Africa needed these sisters, needed this prayer. And um, what ends up happening is he had a certain amount of money as the bishop. His roof, where he slept every night when he was home, was leaking. He would wake up and he would be covered in rain. And they needed to fix his dwelling, but he also needed to buy a building or build a building, I can't remember, for this congregation of sisters. And he said, just get the dwelling for the sisters. It's so hot here that I dry off very quickly anyway. Can you imagine, you know, no disrespect to any of the churchmen today, but there are even some, yeah, I mean, they'll go around to conferences and they'll say some very traditionally conservative things and they talk about resisting Pope Francis and that stuff. Are they sleeping in the rain? Are they willing to do that? I don't think so. I haven't seen it. Lefebvre is a bishop. Bishops today, they live like, they live like uh, politicians. You know, they get driven around. I mean, Lefebvre did have a driver. That was normal. But they get driven around. And they have nice condos or nice, beautiful mansions. And they sit and they have dinner with the so-and-so of the university and whatever. And when the, when the, when the, when a flu bug is released, they close their churches because they don't want to get sick. And here we have Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre who would sleep in the rain so that he could have more nuns. And he would go out and dodge malaria just so he could save one soul. People have no idea who, how great this man was. Okay, I had a plan here to talk about the council 
why he started the SSPX and sort of his life as the um, uh, as the head of the SSPX, as the founder of the SSPX. But I, will, I, I didn't want to go over an hour. I thought it was going to be 45 minutes. I'll probably talk for another hour just to get through that. So I'm going to sort of do a part two to this, but I have a few minutes left. Um, would anybody like to ask any questions? If you would, you can put them in the comments there. Let me just, uh, please, if you do, um, please put sort of a couple question marks at the beginning of them and at the end. And somebody did ask, yes, is there going to be an audio version? I will make an audible version. Yes, I will. I will do that. Um, I have the ability. I just finished another book for Taylor Marshall. It's his second um, second book in the Sword and Serpent series. It's called uh, Tenth Region of the Night, and it'll be out soon. We, it, it, I'm finished recording and processing, but then you got to upload, and um, Amazon has to uh, Amazon has to review it and all this kind of stuff. It takes a couple weeks, basically. Um, in any case. Uh, if you're just joining us right now, I, su I suggest you go back to the beginning. We are talking about the early life, or the early the, for the first half of the life of Archbishop Lefebvre. And um, I did just release a book <clears throat> called SSPX, The Defense, <clears throat> which you can find if you go to Amazon. And I know some people, they don't like to shop on Amazon. And I get it. I, I get it, you know. Um, um, uh, you know, buy locally and all that sort of stuff. But I will tell you what. Also, shout out to my illustrator, Enrique Aguilar. Aguilar. <clears throat> Look at this incredible cover that he made. Isn't that just beautiful? He uh, He's a Photoshop genius, this man. And I couldn't have had such a beautiful... Um, I couldn't have had such a beautiful um, a cover without him. So thank you so much, Enrique, for that. You know, he just... He's such a professional and such an amazing artist. And, and he really did capture... You know, when we were... Um, when we were trying to find a picture, because funny enough, many of the pictures of Archbishop Lefebvre are copyrighted. <laughs> so we were trying to find a picture we could use. And he basically said, you know what we'll do is we'll just like recreate a picture. And he was looking around for images of Lefebvre. And he said, it's almost impossible to find a picture where he's not smiling. <laughs> and that just is a testament. Um, um, <clears throat> let me see here. Questions. Yes, there is a Kindle version as well. If you have problems seeing, there is a Kindle version as well, and you can make the print large. Okay, that works. This question is basically about, have I reached out to unnamed organization to discuss or debate the SSPX? Um, I'll tell you what. I'm open to having debates about the SSPX if they're done in person in front of a crowd. And the reason for that is um, the Internet is a... Is a um, is a poor place for debate. The reason is debates very much have to do with rhetoric and they have to do with delivery. Um, you can't really um, debate well, in my opinion, on the internet. Not that there's fine, you know, there's, there's some decent debates out there. They're informative, but you know, even just things like if you're in person and debating, there's a crowd, there's a, there's a panel, there's a spirit of the thing. There's a command of the room. All of these things are so necessary in order to get your point across. And um, I think that's necessary. Um, that's a good question. Do you believe someone could be saved without any knowledge of the gospel, the Trinity, or the re receiving water of salvation, baptism? Well, this is obviously something that's been debated. Um, I guess I would say, um, well, obviously we believe it's been taught that there's this baptism of desire. So you see this with Christians who are, you know, they profess their faith and they have the intention to be baptized, but then they're martyred for their faith, things like that. Okay, this happens. So, I mean, um, I guess you could say someone doesn't have explicit knowledge. I mean, they've never heard it, but at the same time, interiorly, they seek to unite themselves to God and then God will provide the wisdom in some mystical way. I think we've had examples like that in church history. So I guess that's kind of my non-answer answer for that question. That's a difficult topic because I know uh, there are strong pros and cons to arguments against both sides. We know the no the normal means of salvation are are baptism and the sacraments. So we 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 seek we seek for that to be the normal way, and we should never denigrate those things. And this is it was so egregious when the bishops, um, uh, the 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 um, when the bishop closed the churches, it was just it was ridiculous. Anyway. 
Uh, this is a good question. Are the SSPX bishops, since they had their excommunications lifted, that means they're officially part of the magisterium, correct? Um, I've never thought about it like that. I don't believe their excommunications were, excommunications were ever valid, so I believe they always were. Um, but even if it was valid, uh, and I do argue that in the book why they weren't valid, by the way. If it w if they were valid then then and they're lifted, then I guess that's a pretty good point. That's interesting. Um, I'm contemplating about joining the SSPX Third Order. Oh, it's the best. I uh, I did join the Third Order. Um, and uh, yeah, it was... Um, it's the best thing ever. It's such a simple rule of life, and I'm not an expert at it, and it's and it's going to take a lot of work. But I'm just saying, um, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. the The conferences that we get from our priests, it's just yeah. As a father, it's it's special. So I would, uh, I would say, look into it. And oh, did he believe? Sorry, yeah, good question. So Lefebvre was not a Fenite, if that makes sense. I mean, there's sort of a, con a, a contention there. Um, but I believe Lefebvre was just understood that there had always been this idea of the baptism of desire. So I, I don't know. I think that that exists historically in the church. I think that's just the extent of it. Thank you for saying a rosary for me today. Yeah, that's right. In an open letter to F confused Catholics, Lefebvre does talk about baptism of desire. This is a thing. Now, we don't need to extend that further than it has to be. Uh, it exists, but of course, we don't act like it's. We don't act like it exists. If that makes sense, you know, baptism of desire is a thing historically, but we don't say, "Ugh, oh, baptism of desire." Don't worry about it. We say, <laughs> "We have to," because, um, you know, I think Saint Alphonsus Liguori said a perfect act of contrition, meaning, an act of contrition like on your deathbed or in the face of death, where you would um, perfectly unite yourself in repentance to God without the fear of hell. I mean, that's like almost impossible. I think he said it's more, I think it said it's less likely than someone being raised from the dead. I don't know if that's a mathematical truth or something, but he was trying to say it was extremely unlikely. So yes, baptism of desire, those sorts of things, perfect, per perfect act of contrition. This is something that's been held by many saints. However, we don't, we act as if it's non-existent. If someone dies and we're not sure, we pray very hard that somehow this happened and we pray for their souls, you know, even if they don't have a right of Christian burial and we pray privately and things like that. And God's mercy is, 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 is more than we can understand, but we don't, we don't act as if that's a principle we should live by, if that makes sense. Okay. Um. Any more questions? If not, ladies and gentlemen, please check out the links in the description, not only for the book, but we do have, um, we do have beard oil and beard balm. And I see this here. This is actually pure uh, homegrown, free range Canadian face wool. And I grew it myself and um, it gets grayer and grayer um, as I have more children. So well, this is a good question. Um, if one should debate the SSPX, what would be debated? Yeah, that's actually really good. This is one of the reasons why debates about the SSPX are so difficult. One of the things that I try to transmit in my book uh, is basically, like I use canon law in the book because if, 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 if canon law is there and it can be used, then it's legitimate and we use it. And, I can and you can defend the SSPX. I defend the SSPX against accusations of incarnate and not being incarnate, all these kinds of things. And I use the law very well. I mean, I'm, I, I don't mean to, to be arrogant, but I, I really think, um, you know, I really think that um, I did a good job. I hope I did. Otherwise, I wouldn't have written the book. But I say in the book, you know, we're dealing with principles. We're, we're dealing with the Catholic faith. And this is what is so difficult for people to understand. You know, when you have someone who has basically a modernist perception of Catholicism versus somebody who has a traditionalist perception of Catholicism, they're talking to each other like this. They're talking past each other. They can't really debate the SSPX in that sense. Um, you know, you saw this with the most famous debate between E. Michael Jones, who's very smart, and um, the late Michael Davies. This is in the 90s. This is debates online. I have a portion of it on my YouTube channel. You can look. It's called Throwback. That's the beginning of the title. You can find it from a few months ago. 
Um, and Davies is a traditionalist. E. Michael Jones is not a traditionalist. Very smart on some things, but he's not a traditionalist. They have a different conception of what the church is. Davies is arguing from the way that the church has always been understood. E. Michael Jones is not. So if you're going to debate somebody about the SSPX, to be honest, it should almost be like, you know, be it, thinking of the debate thing, be it resolved, there's a crisis in the church. So maybe, because, you know, there are lots of conservatives who would admit that, uh, like Trent Horn and, and these really well-meaning individuals, they would admit there's a crisis. I think Ralph Martin, who's not a traditionalist, but very conservative, wrote a book like The Church in Crisis or something like that. They would admit that. Um, so be it resolved there's a crisis in the church. Could a bishop consecrate without papal mandate? That would be like, it would almost be better to just sort of debate that. Just leave it on that. Don't, don't get into tit for tat about, um, you know, tit for tat about, um, you know, their opinion of how canon law should be applied. But it's like, are these principles found within church history? Can they be legitimate? That has to be established first. I do that in my book, by the way. So, okay, some good questions here. How old is that face will wool? Oh, the last time I trimmed my beard off was three years ago or something. That was that was a mistake. Um, took a I don't know a few weeks to get it back to this. It goes pretty fast. Um, someone said. Um, you know, if I would have, if you would have asked me two years ago, I would not have joined the SSPX. About joining, I would have said no, but because of the lockdowns, I don't really care anymore. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah, and you know, this this is this is interesting. This this comment here, because what this person is saying, Promethean Kitchen, that's a fun name. What this person is saying is that, and this was the case for a lot of people. Our chapel basically doubled and stayed that size after lockdown. The, the reason is, is because. When you recognize that there's a real emergency and your soul is at risk, you understand the highest principle is the salvation of souls. There's nothing else that matters. Every law in the church, every law in society must serve that highest principle. So if no one is honoring that, then every decision they make is illegitimate. Meaning, you know, sure, they've got some good things to say, but the reason for their existence is being ignored. And the point of their existence, the salvation of souls, is not being fulfilled. Everything else has to serve that. This is what people have realized. This is a very good comment. And um, why does the SSPX get attacked so heavily by even other trads? I kind of want to understand what I, why I'm from Toronto and I just recently joined the SSPX. So why, why is... Well, here's an interesting thing. Um, the only reason, and, and this is not me attacking the traditionalists, other, other trads, you know, the other day I interviewed Father Maudsley. I recommend you watch that. One of the most amazing interviews I've ever done in my life. He was ordained by the fraternity of St. Peter and he loves Lefebvre and he changed his mind. I mean, he changed his mind basically during the lockdowns about Archbishop Lefebvre for lots of reasons. But, you know, he was, he said, there are many fraternity priests who preach very heavily against the SSPX. And he said on my podcast, he said, stop it. <laughs> stop doing that. He said, you know, you're not in competition with other Catholic priests. You're in competition with the devil. Preach against him. You know, don't preach against priests who are preaching the um, the traditional faith and offering mass. Let, let you know, if you have canonical disagreements, it's not your job to preach about it. Preach about the faith, you know, and I, and I think that that was good advice. Um, as far as why lots of groups, well, here's the thing. Um, the old guard... There was, a, there was a split. I mean, the fraternity priests split away from the SSPX to start the fraternity. So there obviously was a, a strong disagreement there. And strong disagreements, and then you come out of contact with each other. I mean, there's going to be bad blood. That's human. So, I mean, I think that's part of it. Um, I don't think preaching against the SSPX is extremely common from the Institute of Christ the King Sovereign Priest. I might be wrong on that, but my impression has been very amenable with any of my interactions. And I, I did go to an Institute of Christ the King Mass in Pittsburgh last October, and wow, it was gorgeous and what a beautiful... What a beautiful parish they had there. Beautiful people. It was wonderful. Um, and, uh, you know, it seemed to me to be holistically traditional. Archbishop or uh, Auxiliary Bishop Schneider offered the Mass, but with the priests and the, and the servers and things from the Institute. And it was wonderful. Um, but they have a different history. They didn't start 
by leaving the SSPX. Okay. Um, but as far as why, you know, I think there's almost maybe, maybe there's a psychology of, and especially in some of the faithful, like if you're given two choices, you know, go to the fraternity, go to the SSPX. Again, I'm not saying there should be any competition. This is silly. But I mean, if you're given two choices and you choose the fraternity over the society or things like that, I mean, what are your reasons for that? I mean, if you're going to justify this decision to yourself, which people just tend to do, I mean, I, I think the reasons are going to be something like, well, you know, I'm going to be in full communion, you know, and it's like, well, that's kind of an accusation that I'm leaving the church, you know, if you're the opposite sort of thing. And I think it's just hard to avoid that. Catholics, you know, you know Michael Matt likes to say unite the clans. Fair enough. But besides that, just worry about your own spiritual life. Worry about your own life. What are any of these Catholic podcasters accomplishing by attacking the SSPX? They are serving the devil when they do that. And the reason I do that, say that is because even if they were correct, even if they were correct about their opinions about some of the canonical realities of the SSPX, even if they were correct about that, what they're saying is not the teaching of the church, meaning it's their opinion and they're expressing things that are their interpretations in order to dissuade Catholics from going to Mass where they can go to Mass. And the places they're dissuading them from offer the traditional Catholic faith, traditional sacraments where they can save their souls. They're dissuading Catholics from saving their souls. There are so many Catholics languishing out there in modernist wastelands, and they latch onto an SSPX parish, and they feel like they're at home. Finally, they can just go to Mass. They can just hear the faith. They can just raise their children. They don't have to worry about all this nonsense. And there are people who want to take that away from them, and it's very strange. It's extremely satanic. And they need to stop. Anyway, I've tried to engage with them. It's impossible. I've tried. Really, people have no idea the lengths I've got. It's, it's impossible. And <clears throat> but they need to stop. They're, they're, they're a friend of Satan when they do that. Because also, too, there are many people, and I've experienced, experienced this in my own life, conservative, good, good conservative-minded Catholics, not traditional, don't have a traditional formation, etc. And... You know, I have people that I've, I know will no longer, basically many of us, but many of us who sort of left the conservative Nova Sordo and went to the SSPX, people will ghost us and they'll you know, excommunicate us from their lives. They'll never talk to us because, you know, they latch onto a podcast by so-and-so or whatever and they say, oh, you guys are these, you know, it just, it, it causes a real division that doesn't need to be there. And not all division is bad. Christ is divisive, by the way. And if people say the SSPX is divisive, this is bad. No, that's not true. The truth is divisive. God, in the beginning of the scriptures, what does he do? He divides the light from the darkness, separates, okay? Christ divides. He sets mother-in-law against daughter-in-law. Not in the sense of he doesn't want you to have union and fraternity in the good sense, but in the sense of Christ is divisive. The truth is divisive. If the SSPX is correct and your local bishop is wrong, then there's a division there, but it's not a division of evil, it's a division of truth. But the division that's being leveled, that's being harbored by these anti-society positions is a satanic division because it's a division of confusion. That's what I'll say about that. No, I wasn't talking about traditionalists, Aaron. Um, okay. Um, I think that's enough there. I think I've gone off enough. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, check the links in the description for the book. Thank you so much to everyone who's helped so far to make it success. Hasn't even been out for 48 hours yet. I think it's been only published for 24 hours. Um, and, um, if you want to grow a nice free range Canadian face sweater, it keeps you warm in the winter. And, um, this is a good comment here. I used to be anti-SSPX, refused to look into things, would say JP2 excommunicated them, and, and but no, that, that didn't happen. I wouldn't know what I was talking about. And uh, this is interesting too from somebody else. He said, uh, 
someone says, I lost friends from going to the TLM. That's the funny thing too, is you lose friends when you just go traditional. So, you know, it's not really about the SSPX. It's a hatred of tradition, in my opinion. Um, but this is interesting as well. I'll talk about this in a later video. But they, uh, it, JP2 did not actually excommunicate the SSPX. It's not actually what happened. Again, people, uh, well, the SSPX in general, because the SSPX per se was never excommunicated. The decision that was leveled against Lefebvre and the bishops was actually by Cardinal Gantin the day before JP2's letter was released. I'll talk about this in detail in another video. But really what we have here, it's sort of like imagine that the court, the Supreme Court releases a decision and then the chief justice after the decision has been rendered releases its opinion. The decision is already made. The opinion does not make the decision. JP2 released a, a, an opinion about a decision that was already made. This is why when the excommunications were recognized as being null and void, which were, were the words of uh, which, 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 what happened in 2009 under Benedict, Benedict didn't lift them. He didn't have to because it wasn't actually, they weren't actually enacted by the Pope. Anyway. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me. Click the links in the description for the book and uh, may God richly bless all of you and Archbishop Lefebvre. Pray for us. God bless. Go to thekennedyreport.com and visit the TKR store to see our new products, Kennedy's Choice Beard Oil. You can use this on your beard to help with alleviating itchiness, dryness, and irritation of skin. And don't worry, no animals were used in testing this product except for myself. Use Kennedy's Choice Beard Balm for a softer, healthier, manageable beard that is made with natural ingredients. And trust me, I know a thing or two about beards. Visit thekennedyreport.com and check out the TKR store. The links for this are in the description.